I really like to go to our next guest now, which is Alex Leitman. Alex is a futurist, and I know he has a lot of insight in how all these developments are going to make changes to all of our lives. I think he has a lot of reasons why decentralized finance is going to be a success in the very near future, stimulated by the pandemic that we are experiencing worldwide. Alex and I talk on a regular basis about the, I would say, effects of economic and social developments as well as the current pandemic. Alex, are you, I hope Baldwin puts you on the show. I know you're there somewhere. Alex? I hope you get connectivity somehow. Uh, let me see. I was looking on my phone to see whether he's there. Let me see. I need to stop sharing probably. Is that it? Let me zoom out. Yeah. There you are, Alex. That was me, the absolute non-technical whatever. I was successful in getting you on board. Hi, Alex. Hi. Okay, so now I just need the little uh, thing that allows me to share my screen, and here it is. Okay, okay. great. I'll just leave the floor to you to okay. tell us exactly what you're... For the people who don't know Alex Leitman, and some of you usually see the Leitman reports, Alex is a very well-known writer, futurist. He advises a lot of companies and, and indeed governments about future developments, about blockchain insights, and a lot of things that have to do with decentralized finance. Um, I don't think you need much of an introduction from most of us anymore, Alex. So I'll leave the floor to you and tell us what's coming in your view for decentralized finance. Okay, great. Hello. Alex Lightman here, nice to meet you. Uh, tune in to the Lightman Report, uh, sponsored by Metaverse DNA, comes out every Thursday. And then Anamika and Eric Gu and I have a conversation about the topics raised in the Lightman Report the following Tuesday. So my title is 20 Reasons, 2020 will be a good year for DeFi and meritocracy. We have a big economic crisis going on. There are more than 33 million people in the US who filed for unemployment benefits in the last six weeks. And we have a reduction in manufacturing. We could have 25% less production this year. We have a decline in tourism of 70%. And to which I might say, hey, where are those 30% coming from? I mean, I would travel if I could, I'd like to, but I don't have any options at the moment. And we'll get into other problems here are the unemployment rates worldwide. I can say this, that the only two nations that are even close to being honest about this are South Africa and the USA, because there's no way all these other nations have had lockdowns like the US, but have kept their unemployment so low. The number, uh, a bunch of these numbers look very suspicious. These numbers are from the IMF, the WTO and others. Also, it says South Africa twice, that looking at the flag, that looks like Saudi Arabia. Since 90% of the people work for the government and the government is cutting back because of oil, that's got to be a higher unemployment rate. And we look at the growth forecast for 2019 to 2021, 20, uh, we see that there was a little bit of growth. You know, basically, uh, India had 4.2%, Indonesia 5%, China 6%, they claim 2% North Korea, uh, South Korea. But then you see big drops. So in the US, we're expecting to drop 6% of our GDP. Uh, Canada 6.5, Mexico 6.6. That's quite a lot. Uh, I don't know how we have a 25% drop in manufacturing and a 70% drop in travel and tourism, but only a 6% drop in GDP. So I think these things are letting us down gently. It'll be a lot worse. And there's scenarios for overcoming this. There's the optimistic scenario, the pessimistic, the trade turnover scenarios. And the IMF says that 157 countries will have entered a recession by the end of 2020. The only reason that they say that they will have entered a recession is because you have to say you entered a recession before you've entered a depression. By any reasonable measure of depression, 30, 35% unemployment is a depression. So we're going to talk about meritocracy. 
And I want to just give, uh, just to cut to it because I have so little time, I'm going to say that meritocracy is like video games. In video games, there was, quote, there was nothing stopping you from going up a level because you're a girl or because you're slightly socially inept or because you're from the north of England instead of from London. It was a kind of meritocracy where everyone could succeed. So as we've had people working from home, as we've had people showing who they are through Zoom and through online means, uh, it all of a sudden levels the playing field. And it means that those people who have a fancy car or better clothes or live closer to work or have a health club membership uh, or went to a great university, everything, all those things have leveled out. And in 2020, life is a lot more like a video game where meritocracy, how well you play, uh, helps your character level up. And of course, gamers like to say to each other when someone complains they couldn't get through a level, get good. So this is all about getting good. In meritocracy, success and reputation that people care about is earned with hard work and talent, but there is an advantage. So you see the boy, Jim, IQ 150, and Seng, IQ 150, same IQ. Uh, one has a basic education, and the other has a, a parent who's there looking out for him. Uh, there's, you know, go, junior, go. Go, sir, from the, the servant. And he's got the latest IT tools, uh, IT tools the best books, uh, ISO certified tutors, enrichment programs, and so on. It gets you a lot closer to success. So this is not saying that, that the level playing field is entirely there because you can still have a lot of advantages. But I would just say that it, that, that stack, that that latest IT tools um, and the ability to access YouTube videos really does level the playing field. Most people I've learned who've learned new skills, I've said, where did you learn that? And 90% plus of the time, they say YouTube. So I promised 20 reasons that this will be a good year, and I've given them in small packages. So here's four reasons 2020 will be a good year for meritocracy and you. At the level of the individual and company, meritocracy can increase your company's valuation. So even as companies are declining on the stock, uh, stock markets, they can go up, and they can go up even for private valuations. I know people who are getting funding. It can increase your standing as an employee of a company if you're able to shine in media such as this, uh, uh, basically online video conferences. You can also have a chance to find a new job because instead of just casting your net locally where you are, you can cast your net globally in many cases. You might even got a better job, one that you like better, that pays better, and that gives you more responsibility. And finally, you might even increase your chances of finding a great romantic partner because people are doing this all online. And my, um, while I'm in a relationship that I'm very happy about, a lot of other people who are looking for them have said that they've never had so many great online conversation with potential dates. Uh, two reasons meritocracy is good for your country and region. Basically, the first is that how countries have handled COVID, how states, how cities have handled it, we now have an objective measure of looking at it. And there's a book called uh, The Measure of Reality, Quantification in Western Europe, 1250 to 1600 by Alfred Crosby. And he basically says that the West went from a nobody in the world around 1000 AD to dominating the world in 1500 because of a mania for measurement. So we have now changed our global culture from last year to this year to it being evalu evaluating countries and cities on a, all comparing them on objective measures. How many people are infected? How many have died? And so I was seeing more praise for Mongolia than anything I've read since the times of Genghis Khan, because Mongolia has no deaths from this. And they're, of course, bordering China on a big over a thousand miles. And second, there's the region's chance to attract the best companies, the most talented people to locate. So a lot of people are decamping from New York as a result of COVID, and it opens up uh, the country to, what is it about New York is almost uh, a trillion dollars a year in, in gross area product for the five boroughs. So that's quite a lot of, of potential business that can be grabbed. And also meritocracy is good for the services around you. It's gonna increase the quality of services. Uh, healthcare, we're now all evaluating healthcare like never before. Financial services, which we're, we've talked about DeFi several times, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more, but from a slightly different perspective. And science, we see the value of science and education. We're just getting a, a course in virology on almost a daily basis. Uh, and then overall, uh, politics and governance, people are all debating these things like never before. 
And diving in a little deeper into DeFi, uh, people need a more reliable way to store value during and after this 2020 crisis. And now, uh, and we have a Lightman report about this, uh, two of them, in fact, it's become a viable alternative to banking deposits and bonds. And DeFi derivatives are a useful way to diversify investment because they basically don't correlate uh, in the same way as other investments that all go in lockstep one or the other. And there's increasing demand for healthcare that might increase demand for emergency loans. And this could increase demand for DeFi services because not everybody has health insurance. There are 24 million people in the US who don't have health insurance. And unemployment spikes might make short-term DeFi-based personal loans more attractive, especially at a time when it costs uh, 20, 30% for these short-term loans, sometimes even more, sometimes 1% a day. And many households can look for ways to invest the, the state aid, that $1,200. And the list and variety of risks emerging from 2020 and beyond can increase the demand for a more diversified set of insurance services and DeFi based insurance could be an alternative. And finally, businesses need funding to keep going. Many small businesses, which account for 70 to 80% of all the employment of a country, including the US, uh, just need one more month to get back. Uh, good news today for me, I live in Los Angeles. They are now, Governor Newsom has now said that the restaurants can start opening again as of this weekend. Uh, I personally will be, will be going into them. I will be using them. I take a lot of selenium, vitamin C, vitamin D, all those kind of things. So I'm less worried about it than most people are. Uh, four reasons 2020 will be a good year for digital currencies and DeFi. First, I think it's huge that China is launching a digital currency. And I think that's going to increase uh, the investments from Chinese in DeFi, especially things related to Tron, NEO, uh, and DNA are our hosts for this conference, and variations of, of the digital yuan. And also, I think it's quite possible for reasons we're going to get to in a second, that traditional banks are going to become bankrupt and uh, say that it might be better to go with smart contracts with DeFi obligations. Also, a lot of people are jumping into Bitcoin. Uh, including people who have been very successful in the past, and DeFi can benefit from that. Uh, and also, the crypto community is investing in Ethereum-based DeFi services because they believe in Ethereum 2.0. So 2019 was bad, but uh, that's like a super, super nasty predator, a Shrike predator. 2020 be like, hold my beer. So here are the big crises. 2020, the, the COVID-19 epidemic, has triggered the deepest crisis in the world economy for decades. And in some ways, you could look at it as centuries in absolute terms. And a lot of these things, though, that are happening are going back to a continuation of problems of the 20th century and World War II. So there's a crisis in uh, international affairs and leadership, which hasn't really been up for grabs quite as much since the end of World War II and the Cold War. And we have our healthcare crisis combined with unfavorable demographic situation. Now, the US of the major nations has by far the best demographic situation. Read or listen to the books of Peter Zihan about that. He makes a devastating case for the US doing okay. There's liquidity risks. There's uh, certain things are going and deflating and other things are uh, inflating. And we have this unemployment tsunami and this global restart and flattening of economic systems. And what's driven the world are these, uh, this willingness of the United States to absorb unlimited trade imbalance from every other nation. Well, we're not going to accept that from every other nation. That's another big part of Zion's uh, writing, that the US is not going to be committed to the global system of trade. And we have a big problem. This is one of the inspirations for the original Satoshi Nakamoto Halloween 2008 white paper, the overprinting by QE. And some of you know this, some of you don't, but this will become as a shock if you don't. On March 15th, 2020, the board uh, of the governors of the Federal Reserve that reduced reserve requirement ratios to zero effective March 26th. So there are no reserve requirements. Your bank does not have to keep a penny in reserves. It used to be that we'd say, well, what if people want their money back? Well, they're keeping $1 out of every five. And China, not so long ago, required you to have $1 out of every 10 in the bank. It's zero right now. That is the worst basis for reserve requirements you can imagine. And then we have a big problem. I wrote a whole book on this. I haven't published yet on uh, food security and the coming disruption. Even before COVID-19 and even before people were plowing 
uh, plowing crops into fields and taking living cows and putting them in a pit and burying them alive and uh, just getting rid of, of tens of billions of dollars of food, we're having the supply chain disruption. And we saw that the Arab Spring happened because of a rise in bread prices and other prices. And COVID-19 is amplifying the risk of a worldwide food price spike. And uh, the cost of a basket, including beans and rice and toilet paper, is up 4.4% in just a month or so. So this crisis is coming, and it's going to lead to the fall of governments because food crises lead to women and children going to the front lines. And then soldiers typically will not fire on those crowds, and the soldiers quit, and the government falls. This happened in the French Revolution. This happened in the Russian Revolution. And it is how major changes happen in the world short of war. We also had the wrong healthcare policy, at least in the United States, but in many other places, because it's so damn expensive. Reduced the hospital beds. People didn't know when to start the lockdown, when to keep them. Other viruses coming up. And uh, and how do you not match all that together? And also this idea of a vaccine as a panacea. We have COVID saying here, my vision is not to kill people per se, but to raise awareness around public health and that the Black Death and the Spanish flu are thinking like, who is this guy? Well, a lot of people are talking about, oh, vaccine, vaccine. Bill Gates is spending tens of millions of dollars promoting him, his medical advice, though he doesn't have a medical degree. But it's worth pointing out that we didn't make a vaccine against the cytomegalovirus, which shreds our immune system gradually over time. Uh, that's something that 70% of people have. 70% uh, of people have herpes, simplex one. We never came up with a vaccine for that. We never came up with a vaccine for AIDS or Ebola. And these are big crises. So we can't depend or count on a, on a vaccine coming to get us back to normal. And so you have to take care of your health every day. One thing I spent uh, yesterday hours with a PhD from USC, and she says that one of these things is that COVID-19 just drains your body of selenium and zinc. So you want to make sure that you've taken plenty of selenium and zinc. And one of the big problem is that bureaucracy, the most effective responsibility avoidance tool ever created. Centralized institutions can't react to all these things. Uh, look at what the WHO has been doing with uh, COVID-19. And we have a crisis of states. States and corporates and other centralized entities are essential to addressing these big things. But they're, um, you know, they're basically running for cover themselves. They, they're sort of shell-shocked. And people accept government, but many states are compromised as a, a fundamental institution. They don't seem to be working. And there's no trust. There's, today, there's no enforcement mechanism and no rules against bad actors. Permanent members of the UN Security Councils have a right to veto. Imagine five certain pools each have a right to cancel and erase a transaction on the blockchain. Um, and then you have the ultima ratio regum. This title refers to the words Louis the Fourteenth ordered cast on every cannon in his armies, which is ultima ratio regnum, which is Latin for the last argument of kings, i.e. the act of declaring war and killing people with weapons. So Einstein says we can't solve our problems with the same, I would say, centralized thinking, to paraphrase him, we use when we created them. And decentralization, talked about by all of the illustrious speakers today, is a solution, an open consensus for what will be 10 billion people. We have over 8 billion now that um, some countries undercount their population. So we've been over 8 billion for a while. Since traditional centralized institutions are in crisis, we can utilize decentralized approaches to organizations and address our future challenges. And we can also, we can't replace all of our centralized institutions, but we can improve them with new technologies. And we need to keep uh, government under control. We need to keep the big high tech companies under control. And I think it's wonderful that Donald Trump is going after <laughs> Google, Facebook, Twitter, and all these, so that these guys are are basically, uh, you know, fighting each other. Uh, play from current slide. There we go. So we need to change the uh, decision making mechanism. We need to make a decentralization the preferred approach to reinvent international organizations and put them under the control of ordinary citizens. So we should have, instead of a world health organization, a decentralized health organization. So it's not all based on one Ethiopian Marxist uh, revolutionary party member who's not a doctor uh, to make all these big giant health concerns and spread the truth. And when who put out the, the, met, uh, the tweet that said, we have studies that show there's no human to human transmission. At that point, it ceased to have legitimacy to deserve that monopoly power. What we need is 
meritocracy, a, a hierarchy of competence going from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence to conscious competence to unconscious competence. And that's what we can have when we have decentralized networks that can point out their errors and people can't hide their errors. And also it's worth pointing out as I conclude my talk that meritocracy is a proof of stake. So proof of stake is an approach in crypto and we could compare meritocracy to proof of stake. And meritocracy works like a proof of stake in that you put your reputation at risk, at stake when you're a decision maker. And in case you come be become corrupt or you make mistakes, it can kill your reputation. So you're very responsible when you're making a decision. And voting by competence or meritocracy points can become a way to improve this. So we now are concluding uh, with digital national currencies are the big things that are coming out this year. Libra was a first attempt conceptually to create programmable corporate money as a viable competitor to fiat. Regardless of what they said, people saw it as that. And China's launch of the digital yuan and special travel points with uh, expiration dates is going to make a difference here. The US and the European Union will have to compete by launching their own digital currencies. And we need to put decentralized financial and political tools uh, to work on all of these. So governments could use smart programmable money to address these. So we don't want parochialism, uh, familyism, corruption, dishonesty. We need to move towards meritocracy. In conclusion, I invite you to join the conversation in the community around the Lightman Report. Uh, comes out every Thursday and sponsored by Metaverse DNA. And join our conversation with Eric and Anamika and I. Um, thank you for your time and thank you for uh, watching my presentation. Thank you so much, Alex. I want to conclude with, with, a, with a, I think, a very vital question. I hope we can get you on camera. Your camera's out. Oh, my camera's uh, out? Yeah, your camera's out. I've got an avatar in the screen. <laughs> Do you see me now? Nope. No, I don't. I don't. With my uh, camera's on. Um, huh. Well, it doesn't matter. You're there. And everybody can see you on the weekly uh, LIGMA report that does, you know, it's very, very best to give independent views on economic and social developments, whether they're related to the pandemic, to gaming or to decentralized finance. I mean, you've been a futurist for many, many years. You're a strategic counsel to many organizations and companies. What I take away from the whole sequence of speakers today with you, ending it up as your 20 points where you see, you know, the real benefit. If you look at that enormous situation of no reserves in a traditional financial system, which is one of my major concerns because it's a ticking time bomb. If we have one other major event that nobody can help basically like this pandemic, what are we going to do? We can't print, you know, trusted money which is not trustless, it's trusted. We, we think we can get goods and assets for that. How do you see the first step of decentralized finance moving into that space? We now got a 6,000 billion euro debt in Frankfurt, you know, buying bonds. We got a um, situation in, you know, many areas in the world with dramatic effects in the economy of the pandemic. We got a lot of countries with absolutely no reserves. What do you think, considering that I think this is an era of major opportunity for a lot of countries, organizations, entrepreneurial situations? What do you think of the first step that we can take worldwide, actually, I would say? What would be the first step to have decentralized finance move? Well, into that's, that's an easy question. You, you take your phone and you make it your bank. You put a crypto wallet in it and you start on a small level uh, buying, selling, borrowing, and loaning with crypto because crypto can survive the collapse of fiat currencies. And we have this Wikipedia. If you want to think there's anything permanent about uh, traditional currencies, about fiat currencies, go look at the wiki on dead fiat currencies. It's very long. And one of the things is that there's hidden history in the United States. The librarian of Congress, Daniel Borston, wrote a book called Hidden History. You can literally write books on history that isn't taught anywhere. And one of the things that should be in that book, but is hidden, even from hidden history, is that there have been not one, but two national currencies in the United States that are dead. 
So we used to have the continental. That was the U.S. dollar of the time, and it was supposed to last forever. It doesn't exist anywhere. Nobody's ever heard of it. At one point, the U.S. dollar will also be something in the past, only known by historians, because whatever the current currency is of that day will seem like it has always been in the past and always will be in the future. Um, it's what, it's what uh, George Orwell said in 1984. Who controls um, the, uh, the, the present controls the past. Who controls the past controls the future. And so we do that about money. Money is a form of mind control. And what we need to do is we need to seek allies who have crypto wallets. And in this point, I have to say it's the greatest failure of the crypto advocates in that in a world of 8 billion people and 4 billion who are connected to the to wireless broadband and 8 billion mobile phone subscriptions, there are only 50 to 75 million, at most 100 million crypto wallets with anything in them. I don't mean cyber dust or crypto dust in them. I mean something, you know, that you can actually buy something, a cup of coffee, a loaf of bread, whatever. And, uh, and by the way, I paid $10 for a loaf of bread yesterday. That's something I've never done in my life. I went to Erwan and bought a nice loaf of bread, but it was $10. $10 for a loaf yeah. of bread? Yes. Are you serious? Yes. I mean, what kind of bread? Were totally packed. There were more people in the Erwan grocery store next to the Grove and the farmer's market, which is a major retail area. There were more in that store having $1,000 bags of groceries than there were in all the farmer's market and all the Grove, which is, you know, I don't know, a multi-hundred million dollar retail area. So wow. 10 bucks for a loaf of bread. I yes. mean, fight it. Come on. What's that? It had to be tasting really good to cost. Oh, it is. It's, a, it's the best. I'll bring you some when I come to the Netherlands. <laughs> well, but we, uh, have but we have to all get, we have to basically become prophets of wallets. They're, 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 Guy Kawasaki kind of pioneered the role of evangelist when he was out promoting the Mac, and he has a lot of books on it. But ultimately, I think every crypto person needs to get all their friends and family wallets and start sending them money. And we should start in week. It's, it's very easy to get people in crypto. All you have to do is say, hey, set up this wallet and I'll send you some money. Well, maybe that's the one to take away to expand global adoption. If everybody this year adopts two other people, we'll grow 300%. Well, I'm hoping for two a month. I hope two everybody a get two a month. That's not ever asked. I'm going to say to goodbye to you for today, Alex. We'll okay, speak thank you for your time. Yeah. And thank you for our weekly conversations. Okay. I just wanted to say in closing, it's a great pleasure to work with you and Eric and that the, the generous, kind, thoughtful, reliable, loyal people that they see today is what I see on a regular working basis with both of you. I really enjoy my time with you. Thank you so much, Alex.